The burden of my talk will be to draw out how feminism has contributed to the cultural collapse and the rising authoritarianism we now see across most of the West. Those two things, cultural collapse and authoritarianism, are linked. Just as a healthy body resists disease, so a healthy culture resists authoritarianism. Conversely, cultural degeneracy will aid the authoritarian's purpose. In recent years, I've become even more concerned about the growing authoritarianism than about gender issues per se. But the purpose of my talk is to demonstrate that those two phenomena are closely connected. Not that feminism is the sole cause of the authoritarianism, which is now in the ascendancy in most Western and Anglophone countries. Of course not, but feminism is one of the more significant contributors to it. Indeed, if one links the rising authoritarianism to our cultural decline, and I do, then there's a strong case for feminism being the leading cause of the authoritarianism due to its significance in promoting Western cultural collapse. As we will see, this is particularly so in respect of the destruction of the two-parent heterosexual family and the rise of sexual libertinism, the so-called sexual revolution. My argument will be in three parts. The first part demonstrates that feminism is itself directly authoritarian within its own purview. That part will hardly be a revelation to this audience, despite being incomprehensible to almost everyone else, lamentably. The second and third parts address how the political and social effects of feminism spread this authoritarianism into the general culture. Part two considers the overtly political dimension. Feminist alliances with political power centers have led to feminism being incorporated into those power structures, which then act as the vectors of feminist authoritarianism. In addition, the faux moral credentials of feminism lend credence to said power centers operations, which promote their own ideologically based authoritarian policies. The feminist enthusiasm for hate crime policing and the resulting censorship is an example. Finally, and to my mind most significantly of all, part three relates to how feminism has promoted sociological conditions which are known to be causally related to the rise of totalitarianism. This part may be less well known even to this audience. And so to part one, feminism is itself authoritarian. I expect I shall be pushing on an open door with this audience. Nevertheless, let me rehearse just a few of the authoritarian features of feminism. Feminism is, of course, dogmatic, admitting no possibility of its ideological perspective being wrong, despite being wildly at variance with empirical reality in most of its key aspects. This intransigent inflexibility, coupled with the natural moral authority which women wield over men, constitutes authoritarian control of the dominant social narrative and acts as the driving force for these specific instances of authoritarianism that follow. There is, for example, the systemic refusal by the feminist controlled National Union of Students to allow men's groups on UK university campuses. In the wider society, all instances of all male spaces have been systematically eradicated, either by having them shut down as being axiomatically misogynist or by insisting on female membership with consequent destruction of their previously masculine ethos and operation. 
This is the classic behaviour of totalitarian regimes, in which any gatherings are permitted only under the watchful eye of a party member. In sharp contrast, all female spaces are vigorously protected. We have been told for many years that universities are a hotbed of sexual assault by men on young women. Yet universities increase in popularity amongst young women with every passing year. Now the focus is also on the purported epidemic of sexual harassment of girls in schools. Yet where are the calls for girls to be educated in single sex schools? I hear none. It's advocates for boys such as myself who argue in favour of single sex schools after the age of 11. Feminists do not. Could it be that the incessant talk of sexual harassment of girls is actually about control of boys, not about protection of girls at all? And so the last thing the feminists would want would be boys-only schools, as that would deny them the opportunity to have boys under their control, being raised to be confident feminists. The incessant narrative on Vogue, violence against women and girls, is a classic feminist control strategy. I do not deny that bad things happen to females, sometimes at the hands of males, but that does not detract from the claim that Vogue is a control strategy. Actually, it just adds to its potency. In particular, Vogue in the form of domestic abuse is used to great effect to place control in the hands of a mother to the detriment of the father in child contact disputes, one of the feminist weapons in the destruction of fatherhood and the consequent rise of social atomization. We will see in part three that this social atomization also promotes wider cultural authoritarianism. That feminism is a deliberately authoritarian modality in the context of parenting is clear. Political correctness closely allied with feminism is authoritarian control of what you are permitted to say. Our common experience these days is that one really cannot say what one likes, not without rapidly being denied a platform to say anything. Here's an example of something you can't say. Women sometimes lie about rape, actually quite frequently. Here's another, abortion is bad. You can probably say that in the USA, but not in the UK. There's no debate on abortion in polite circles in the UK. It's not permitted. But here's a less appreciated truth that cannot be said either. Equality is not a moral precept. Moral precepts have a particular characteristic. They are exhortations on the individual to behave in a certain way. Equality is not that, is it? You cannot exhort an individual to be equal. It's a category error to regard equality as a moral precept. It's not even the right kind of thing to be a moral precept. What has been done here is to conflate equality with fairness. Now, fairness is a virtue and hence a moral precept. One can indeed exhort an individual to be fair. So the trick is to conflate a political policy of equality with the virtue of fairness, thus falsely conferring upon it unassailable moral rectitude. This is moral usurpation. And then proceed to redefine equality itself, now dubbed equity as equality does not mean treating everyone the same, but treating some people better. It is never explained just how much better certain people need to be treated in order to achieve true equality. It's a blank check. By this cunning contrivance, preferential treatment of some, in this case women, is imbued not merely with acceptability, 
but with the force of moral obligation. This causes any objection to said preferencing to be interpreted as misogyny. And now to object to it in the form of DEI is to face dismissal from your job. I commend this mechanism of moral usurpation to your closest attention because it is the trick that is used over and over again by progressives and their ilk to inveigle otherwise decent people into passionately defending policies which are openly prejudiced, unjust, and socially destructive. And so to part two, the political dimension. If you agree that transnational intergovernmental bodies like the United Nations, the World Economic Forum, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the European Court of Human Rights, and the European Court of Justice and many others are the source from which much of the authoritarianism stems, then feminism is also immediately implicated because feminism is in close alliance with these bodies. And feminism has defined the moral landscape for all of them to follow. To understand how feminism became so closely allied to political power centers, one needs to appreciate the role of moral usurpation. I have covered this in previous talks and in my book, The Destructivists, so I'll be brief. What feminism gains from such an alliance is clear, namely access to influence. What political bodies such as national governments or the UN get in return is a share in the apparent moral rectitude with which feminists surround themselves. The example of equality illustrates the manipulative mechanism of moral usurpation. The valid moral desiderata of fairness has been usurped and repackaged as equity. By this piece of verbal conjuring, a political opinion is given the force of moral obligation. This is the foundational trick that is used repeatedly to manipulate public perception and deceive the masses into enthusiastically embracing policies whose impact will be very different from what they have been led to believe. Thus, moral usurpation facilitates authoritarianism. The elite few have, since time immemorial, used divide and conquer and moral usurpation to control the populace to advantage themselves and disadvantage others. Feminism is part of that process as it is enacted today. It's tempting to express this as the political establishment, irrespective of political party, having been captured by the partisan feminist lobby. But in truth, it is not a capture, but an alliance, a symbiosis. Feminism is a tool for those of an authoritarian bent which tends to be everyone in positions of power unless that power is closely monitored, severely restricted, and frequently curtailed by democratic sovereignty. But the political process is also a tool for feminism. This is the feminist establishment. It operates on the basis that feminism gifts the establishment with ostensible moral legitimacy, whilst in return, the establishment yields some political influence to feminism. The establishment is feminist. Just 200 years ago, Christianity was embedded within all facets of the establishment. So is feminism today. This is the source of feminism's access to formal power, which, by the nature of the ideology, naturally morphs into authoritarianism. It was to be nearly a century before men knew anything was afoot with this feminist business, but in 1888, the feminist movement had already formed its first global pressure group, 
the ICW, the International Council of Women, still going strong today. Do note that the ICW was formed 30 years before nearly half of adult men had the vote in the UK. Founded in 1904, the IAW, the International Alliance of Women, is an international NGO that works to promote women's rights and gender equality with an ethos that is, quote, inclusive, intersectional and progressive liberal feminist. It was historically the main international organisation that campaigned for women's suffrage. When it was founded, nearly half of adult men in the UK still had 14 years to wait until they would get the vote. The WILPF, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, was founded initially as the International Women's Congress in 1915, when UK men were too busy dying in the World War I trenches to lobby for their own benefit. Floridly feminist, like all these organisations, here's a quote from their website. Violent masculinities shape institutions, communities and intimate lives. These norms are enabled by institutions that heroize violence and fund the war system. To transform currently accepted gender norms and practices, we must meaningfully engage men and boys to identify, address and challenge the structural causes of gender inequality and men's use of violence and involvement in armed conflict. Should I mention here the Pankhurst's very active involvement in coercing men to join up to fight in the World War trenches explicitly to save the women of Britain, quote, from a fate too horrible to mention. They were doing this as the WILPF was being formed. The League of Nations, the first intergovernmental organization of its kind, was formed in 1919 in the aftermath of World War I. In the years that followed in the 1920s, the aforementioned ICW, IAW and WILPF all had strong links and worked closely with the League of Nations, the WILPF enjoying consultative status. Allow me to labour the point. Multiple international feminist organisations existed and had positioned themselves so as to enhance their influence via the League of Nations as soon as it was formed in 1919. That this massive fillip to the burgeoning power of feminism was achieved through an organisation whose creation was primarily a response to the slaughter of men in World War I is an irony I do not want to be lost upon you. When the United Nations were formed in 1945, it incorporated all the feminist groups formally linked with the League of Nations. A full account even of just the founding of the many international feminist organisations and accords that now exist would be lengthy and I'll not spend more time on it. However, the Beijing platform of 1995 must be mentioned because that established gender mainstreaming as UN policy. This meant from that time onward, all policies and initiatives by the UN would be obliged to place women's empowerment first. This and subsequent resolutions established a feminist veto over every policy and activity in the UN thereafter. And from the UN, it would trickle down to the nation states. This is the mechanism by which the globalist elites harness feminism into their service and by which feminist policies become obligatory everywhere. 
I regale you with this history because from the UN's lead, every transnational organization has adopted feminist programs and policies. This includes, but is not limited to, NATO, the World Health Organization, the World Bank, the European Central Bank, the International Monetary Fund, all the climate change conferences, the OECD, the European Union, the European Institute for Gender Equality, the Council of Europe, which gave us, of course, the Istanbul Convention, the Bank for International Settlements, and, of course, our old friend, the World Economic Forum. My point is simply this. If you regard any or all of those transnational globalist organisations as being implicated in the rise of authoritarianism, and I do, then the embedding of feminism in all of them implicates feminism in that same authoritarianism. Specifically, these globalist organisations claim moral status from their feminist credentials and the feminists essentially trade this for a share in their power. The authoritarianism of both is thereby enhanced further. Closer to home, feminism is virtually obligatory within mainstream politics in the UK. Full-on feminists occur across all political parties, and hence feminism is the largest caucus in Parliament. This guarantees that any bill which is feminist in nature is certain to be passed with a large majority. Whilst there will be MPs who are less comfortable with feminism, they will nevertheless repeat well-worn feminist shibboleths when questioned, because they dare not appear anti-feminist. Any male MP declaring himself to be anti-feminist would almost certainly be thrown out of his party, be deselected and lose his job. While a couple of MPs have criticised feminism, none have gone so far as to declare their anti-feminism. They dare not. What is this but authoritarianism at the highest level of UK national politics? It has come about by moral usurpation. To be against feminism is not seen as simply a political opinion or a valid social criticism. It is almost universally perceived as morally unacceptable. But this faux moral positioning of feminism is a trick. Feminism is itself reprehensibly unethical. To see how this authoritarianism within UK government or its ancillary services impacts on individuals, consider the case of the PREVENT programme. Following numerous acts of terrorism on British soil, mostly by jihadi Islamists, the PREVENT programme was set up in 2019 with the intention of identifying radicalised persons who seemed likely to be future terrorists. But this was never going to be the way PREVENT would operate in practice when the likes of Hope Not Hate were instrumental in targeting the suspected individuals. I refer you to the longer transcript for details. For now, I note that people were targeted by PREVENT based on conservative politics, people who by no stretch of the imagination were a terrorist threat. In particular, incels, one of the feminists' chief hates, were targeted by PREVENT in large numbers, despite being neither ideological nor linked to terrorism. The example of PREVENT illustrates how authoritarianism is enacted when ideologically intolerant individuals and organisations are suitably placed to subvert what might appear to be a reasonable, even desirable objective. Behind authoritarianism lie ideologues who are so certain that they are right and that opposing, view, and that opposing views are morally insupportable that they feel justified 
in doing anything necessary, however unethical, to suppress dissent. Now I turn to feminism's promotion of the sociological conditions which degrade culture and create a pre precursor state to totalitarianism. I have never been content with a purely political level of explanation. Actually, political terms do not provide an explanation at all. They only provide a taxonomic system, a convenient means of pigeonholing people into broad systems of opinion. To understand why people hold particular opinions, we are in the realms of psychology and sociology. Here I present the case for feminism being responsible for creating certain psychosocial conditions which are known precursors of authoritarianism. There are two main sources, the work of Matthias Desme and that of J.D. Unwin. Firstly, Matthias Desme's theory of mass formation as the psychological origin of totalitarianism. Desme cites his inspiration as being Hannah Arendt's classic text on the origins of totalitarianism. By mass formation, Desme means a form of mass hypnosis, which affects perhaps 20% to 35% of the population. People become, in my words, assimilated into the Borg and cease to have an individual mind. Instead, they have a single hive mind. The condition seems to come about spontaneously when conditions are right. There are four contributory conditions, according to Desme, but three can be seen as stemming from the first, which is therefore the key factor. It is this social atomization. This is when people become disconnected from both local communities and the broader society and culture. Social atomization is related to Durkheim's conception of anomie, which refers to societies afflicted by disintegration. It is characterized by a breakdown in the social fabric and a breakdown in leadership. The former is related to an erosion of moral standards within society, whilst the latter involves a perceived lack of legitimacy, effectiveness and trust in the political leadership. I think we can say that these conditions are in place in most of the West. I note in passing that anomie is known to increase under so-called multiculturalism. I say so-called multiculturalism because I don't think such a thing is actually possible, it being a very different proposition to the factual case of multi-ethnicity. The negative impact of multi-ethnicity uh, multi on social cohesion was initially associated with the work of Putnam in 2007. And this rapidly led to many studies of the phenomenon. Putnam argued that living in an ethnically heterogeneous environment was harmful to interpersonal trust and undermined social connections between and within ethnic groups. Faced with ethnic diversity, people would tend to retreat from social life. The occurrence of multi-ethnic spaces thus causes so-called multiculturalism to become merely a euphemism for cultural fragmentation and decline. The process of increasing social atomization is related to ethnicity rather than gender, or at least this process is. Though I note yet again that the close relationship of the two via intersectionality and progressivism means that they are not politically independent factors. Another mechanism for promoting social atomization is far more clearly related to feminism, namely 
the collapse of marriage and the increase in unstable, short-lived cohabiting between intimate couples. Only those in the deepest denial could dispute that this most dramatic change in our social structure was not the result of feminism and the associated sexual liberation, a term which increasingly seems inappropriate. In the UK, it has become notorious that most cities have districts dubbed man deserts, which consist overwhelmingly of single mothers in relatively poor housing, living largely on benefits. I expect the same occurs throughout the West. My own research is based on data from a Welsh charity, which assists non-resident parents with child contact issues, confirms the reality of social isolation amongst non-resident fathers. Validated psychology measures of social and emotional isolation has revealed the extreme extent of loneliness suffered by these rejected fathers, as the graphs here show. Finally, I note yet another mechanism which promotes social atomization, namely the tendency for middle-class university attendees to leave their childhood communities and never to return, becoming instead the feedstock for the cosmopolitan globalist anywheres, a euphemism for those who belong nowhere. This initiating causal factor, social atomization, which we have seen has several causative factors of which feminism is one, promotes three further precursor conditions which prime a society for mass formation, according to Matthias Desme. The second condition is lack of meaning in life. The third condition is a free-floating anxiety. Free-floating because, crucially, it has no cause which is apparent to those affected by it. The fourth condition is a growing inchoate frustration which leads to irrational lashing out aggression. Think of demonstrations which have turned rapidly into riots of destruction. It's worth pointing out here that this lashing out corresponds to Mary Eberstadt's primal screams. Eberstadt attributes the cause to identity politics which she argues resulted from the sexual revolution and the breakdown of the family, and which, in turn, is, in my opinion, indubitably a consequence of feminism, though Eberstadt herself has a different take on the role of feminism. Hence, we come full circle back to feminism. As regards the significance of the sexual revolution, that is to say, the replacement of sexual continence with sexual libertinism, Eberstadt echoes the earlier work of J.D. Unwin, which I will shortly summarise. These three further conditions, lack of meaning, free-floating anxiety and inchoate frustration, arise from social atomization. The process by which they lead to totalitarianism, according to Desme, can be summarised in two steps. Firstly, there is a suggestion within the public sphere, essentially a negative propaganda, that a certain outgroup is responsible for all the ills that the public are feeling. This gains rapid acceptance, irrespective of empirical evidence to the contrary, because it affords relief to the believer. It provides a target upon which their previously free-floating anxiety can settle. This provides relief to the individual akin to having an illness diagnosed. Secondly, becoming a believer also provides an antidote to the root causes of their unhappiness. Being a believer provides the missing sense of meaning in their lives. It also replaces their isolation with absorption into a community with a clear mission and narrative. To quote Desme, through this process, 
and individual pivots from a highly aversive and painful psychological state of social isolation to the maximum in interconnectedness that exists amongst the masses. This creates a kind of intoxication, which is the actual impetus to go along with the mass forming narrative. He adds, what one thinks does not matter. What counts is that people think it together. In this way, the masses come to accept even the most absurd ideas as true, or at least to act as if they were true. The masses believe in the story, not because it is true, but because it creates a new social bond." Unquote. In my words, this is why social justice types will react rather bafflingly with the claim that you're denying my existence when you attempt to dislodge their views on the basis of empirical data. They have built their sense of self around conformance with a narrative whose purpose has nothing to do with truth or justice, but is motivated entirely by avoidance of the negatives of isolation, anxiety, and lack of meaning. The ends of a totalitarian system are served by the process of mass formation by the relatively simple expedient of ensuring that the popular narrative is suitably directed. The knowing actors who do this directing are a tiny band whose impact is massively amplified by the mass formation process. These knowing actors may or may not be within the mass formation themselves. The nature of the tiny band which exerts the directing influence on the mass formation process is further elucidated in great detail by Andrew Lobachevsky in the book Political Pomerology, The Science of Evil, Psychopathy and the Origins of Totalitarianism. I refer you to the full transcript for details. And so, finally, to the work of J.D. Unwin. Of all the pieces of evidence, this is the most damning in my view. The rise of second wave feminism in the 1960s was accompanied by a sexual revolution. Prior to that time, there were strong social, legal and religious constraints regarding sexual conduct. There was severe social stigma attached to couples cohabiting outside of marriage and very heavy stigma indeed regarding childbirth outside wedlock. This ethos went together with divorce being rare and largely confined to the wealthier classes. Of course, sex happened outside of marriage, but it had to be kept secret, and this limited its extent. Knowledge of such behaviour in a public figure would destroy their reputation and probably end their career. As a result, all but a very small percentage of children were raised in a two-parent heterosexual couple family. The so-called sexual revolution blew all that away. I need not rehearse what Western social structure has now become. 50% of children in the UK are born outside marriage now. Any restrictions on sex are now regarded in our brave new faux liberal morality as unacceptable infringements on individual freedom. Mary Eberstadt points to the contraceptive pill as the cause of the sexual revolution. Certainly it was a key enabler. But would the pill without feminism have still led to the sexual revolution? I think not. The pill would prevent pregnancy, but that would not obviate the social stigma without a change in the popular ethos about sex. And that was provided by feminism. Indeed, this radical change in our sexual ethics 
was not unique to our time and culture, as one might have assumed. There are many historical occurrences of cultures whose early sexual restraint changed to an ethos of sexual libertinism, and these were not brought about by a contraceptive pill. In 1934, the Oxford sociologist J.D. Unwin published an epochal work, Sex and Culture, which detailed the effects upon a culture of such loosening of sexual constraints. Moreover, his was an empirical study based on an exhaustive analysis of historical instances of cultures which underwent such changes in social mores. Unwin examined the data from 86 societies and civilizations to see if there was a relationship between sexual freedom and the flourishing of cultures. Unwin noted that whilst the emancipation of women is logically quite distinct from the extension of women's sexual opportunity, in practice the two have so far always gone together. Here, women's emancipation is understood to mean the social, legal and political equality between the sexes. In respect of the existence of historical cultures from which to draw data regarding the effects of increased sexual license, Unwin writes, It is often supposed that female emancipation is an invention of the modern white man. Sometimes we imagine that we have arrived at a conception of the status of women in society which is far superior to that of any other age. We feel an inordinate pride because we regard ourselves as the only civilised society which has understood the sexes and that they must have social, legal and political equality. Nothing could be farther from the truth. A female emancipating movement is a cultural phenomenon of unfailing regularity. It appears to be the necessary outcome of absolute monogamy. The subsequent loss of social energy after the emancipation of women, which is sometimes emphasised, has been due not to the emancipation, but to the extension of sexual opportunity which has always accompanied it. In human records, there is no instance of female emancipation which has not been accompanied by an extension of sexual opportunity. Unwin provided detailed criteria to clarify what was meant by sexual constraint versus sexual freedom and the degrees between the two. Similarly, he also systematised how cultural vigour, or lack thereof, could be clearly defined and categorised. As regards the latter, Unwin described four degrees of cultural flourishing. Specific criteria were devised which allowed a given culture at a given period to be classified into one of four levels of cultural achievement. The lowest level, the zoistic, is defined as entirely self-focused on day-to-day -day li life wants and needs with no interest in any deeper understanding or philosophy. This is a dead or inert culture. The highest level, the rationalistic, is defined by the use of rational thinking to understand nature and the deployment of such rational understanding to improve the everyday lives of the people. Similarly, Unwin defines categories describing degrees of sexual constraint or license, three applying before marriage and four after marriage. The former ranged from strict chastity to complete sexual freedom. After marriage, the categories ranged from absolute monogamy, i.e. one spouse for life, to a range of other cases, including types of polygamy and also serial monogamy, permitting divorce. What Unwin found from his detailed study provides a prediction 
or the end point of the trajectory that Western civilization is now following. Here are the headline conclusions. 1. Increased sexual constraints, either before or after marriage, always led to increased flourishing of a culture. 2. Conversely, increased sexual freedom always led to the collapse of a culture in about one century, which Unwin aligns with three generations. 3. The clearest correlation with the flourishing of a culture was premarital chastity, especially for women. This had a highly significant effect in both directions. Chaste singles make for a flourishing culture. Sexually active singles result in cultural decline. The largest effect size on culture was for premarital chastity coupled with absolute monogamy. Monogamy without the availability of divorce. Five, whenever the ethos of premarital chastity was abandoned, then absolute monogamy, theism, and rational thinking also disappeared within three generations. Six, whenever total sexual freedom was embraced by a culture, that culture collapsed within three generations to the lowest state of flourishing, becoming zoistic, effectively a dead culture. At this point, the culture is usually conquered or taken over by another culture with greater social energy. Seven, as a general rule, changes in sexual mores only realize their full cultural effect by the third generation. In our case, if we count the start of the sexual revolution as the 60s, then Unwin's thesis predicts its full effects will only be realized in the currently rising generation, and perhaps not fully until around 2060. Let me remind you that Unwin published his study in 1934, some 30 years before second wave feminism and the sexual revolution even started. You may be tempted to imagine that his predictions will not apply to us, that we are somehow immune to what befell previous cultures. But in as far as sociology results from psychology, and in as far as the psychology in question is innate, being of evolutionary origin, there are no obvious grounds for dismissal of Unwin's predictions. Moreover, being now two full generations into the predicted decline, we should be seeing much of the cultural degeneration already, are we? Kirk Durston has summarised the position as follows. One, absolute monogamy has been almost universally abandoned. Two, theism has already declined steeply. And three, and I quote here, the swiftness with which rational thinking declined after the 1970s is astounding. Durston cites the abandonment of objective truth in postmodernism as an aspect of this decline of rationality, together with the promotion of feelings over empirical evidence and the acceptance by large swathes of society that one can identify as things that one simply is not, be it a man identifying as a woman or a girl identifying as a cat. The usual get out in these cases is that Unwin's correlation is not actually causal. However, I note that he insisted that it is. For example, he wrote, the evidence is that a cultural advance has been caused by a factor which produces thought, reflection and social energy, and that it occurs only when the sexual opportunity has been limited. I submit, therefore, that the limitation of the sexual opportunity must be regarded as the cause of the cultural advance. And again, he wrote, Compulsory sexual continence 
must be regarded as the immediate cause of any cultural advance. Any extension of sexual opportunity must always be the immediate cause of a cultural decline. In summary, then, it seems that there is nothing that can be done to avert the degeneration of the West. It is highly likely that more vigorous cultures will supplant the traditional Western culture, be it Islamism or cultures from the Indian or Chinese subcontinents. If Westerners wish to salvage something of our culture, perhaps with a view to its resurgence in some future Renaissance, then the lesson of the above observations, especially those of Unwin, is that parallel subcultures of traditionalists will need to form which rigorously exclude feminism and adopt a strict code of sexual ethics, including premarital chastity, strict monogamy and marriage for life. Whilst Unwin notes that this has never been known in the past without also involving female subjugation, this may not be unavoidable. Emancipation of women in the sense of full social, legal and political equality is not logically contradictory with premarital chastity and absolute monogamy. It is the latter, though, which would appear to be the essential factors. Thank you.